Good afternoon and good evening to our audience online and a very warm welcome to our IFI mission to Karamanut Mash earthquake sequence of the 6th of February 2023 presentation. My name is Valentina Putrino and tonight as the IFI chair, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce you the IFI team who mobilized in the aftermath of this catastrophic catastrophic earthquake sequence, which started with a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the 6th of February, 2023, causing as of the 20th of March, 2023, 50,096 deaths, including people who went missing or presumed to have died in the earthquake, 107,204 people wounded, 6,660 deaths, of foreign nationality, mostly Syrian refugees, 1,297 un unidentified deaths, the family of whom we keep in our thoughts. Yasemin Aktas Didem from UCL and Emily So from Cambridge University have led the effort as team leaders of the group who has was physically deployed on site and the remote team who did instead help from the UK. It is worth mentioning that over 70 expressions of interest were sent to our team leaders for scrutiny, proving the sheer of interest and the resonance that the work conducted by IFIT has been gaining over the years. On behalf of the main committee and the institution to which IFIT belongs, I would like to express my, my and our deepest gratitude to Yasemin and Emily for in, their incredible effort, to each and every member of the deployed team and the remote team, which, is, which has worked out to be a very effective and cohesive mix of truly international people, both students and experienced members from industry and academia, we have helped, but most importantly, our thank goes to the local partners who have helped immensely with the logistic and even more importantly, with the tons of documents and information that were only published in local language. Your help has proven crucial. Now, without further ado, I invite you all to post your questions in the chat box for the speaker's consideration at the end of the presentation. The answers will be either provided in the, in the chat or posted in the website and blog. And without further ado, I leave the floor to Emily. Thank you. Thanks, Valentina, and good afternoon, good evening to everybody um, online. Um, just a, a quick slide, really, to show our team members. As um, Valentina said, we have a big team um, out of the 70 expressions of interest. We have 30 members in our team, both um, supporting the, the effort remotely, and these are our, our team members here. And then next slide. Uh, we have the field team who actually went to Turkey um, from the 13th and 17th of March. Um, this presentation will be a combination of both um, the remote and field teams observations and that were done in the UK and of course in Turkey as well. The next slide. Um, before I start um, passing the floor to my team members, I just want to quickly introduce you to the approach we took for this mission. Next slide. Um, since COVID, um, EFIT have operated a, a, a hybrid, what we call a hybrid mission, because of the constraints to travel during COVID years, um, we relied entirely on um, scouring the, the internet and our, our colleagues abroad for help in, in, in furnishing our knowledge of, of earthquakes during that time. And we found this to be actually very beneficial um, because traditionally we've relied purely on data collected from the field um, to really test and look at the uh, real performances of structures and infrastructure in the natural environment. But we can't always get to the field within the first few weeks of the earthquake. As was the case for this earthquake, we were discouraged um, by our local contacts because of the chaotic um, scenes that were in the affected areas that was huge and we weren't able to get to the field early. 
So all we did was that we relied on um, our um, news outlets, the web-based data collection tools that we had, and also the comprehensive reports that were coming out of Turkey um, from academia, as well as from the Turkish government. And we were therefore able to, before even deploy, to look at the, um, the earthquake in a kind of a systematic way. Next slide, please. And actually coupling this were also a lot of drone images as well that came from news outlets. So in planning the hybrid mission, um, all team members, remote and field uh, members, dedicated a whole week prior to the field deployment to discuss the themes that we we're going to cover and also the research questions we we're going to ask. As I said, there was a lot of work already done within the first few weeks of the earthquake by our Turkish colleagues. And our job really was to collate that, to review it, and also to validate the data sources, both in Turkish and in English. As Valentina said, it was in, in, invaluable for us um, that our team consisted, consisted of so many Turkish speaking um, members. So on the right, you can see some graphic uh, representations of data that was collected by the Turkish government of the 11 provinces they declared as disaster zones. That was in a tabulated form in a table that was available online. And our team before we deployed were able to collect and represent this um, graphically and spatially so we can actually look at where we'd go as a group um, for our field visits and decide on the locations for that. Um, we also were able to do a lot of benchmarking and ground truthing with existing reports um, to build the context of the disaster um, before we deployed. The remote team continued to support the field team whilst they were on the field by providing information and they were asking for uh, supplementary reports that um, would help them um, put the things they were seeing on site in context. So the next slide, please. So the map on the right shows the, the, lo the locations where the field team deployed, um, the structures team, the infrastructure, the geotechnics team were all in the field and we followed uh, mainly the, the fault um, rupture segments of the 7.8 and 7.5 earthquakes. And the lecture tonight will be um, structured in the following way. We're going to hear from our seismic tectonics team who would tell you more about the context of the earthquake as well as the ground motions that were detected. We will have geotechnical observations from the team, um, structural ob observations, as well as um, presenting some of our remote sensing um, um, observations and um, uh, findings. We will then move on to infrastructure and relief response and recovery, and Yasmin will finish with key messages and our next steps. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the this floor to um, Ashling, and next slide please, who will tell you more about the seismic tectonics of the region. Good evening everyone. Um, so as Emily said, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the seismic tectonics and the geological background um, to the recent Karamamarash earthquake sequence. Um, the region itself is, that was affected um, is a triple junction where three tectonic plates meet and are bounded by the East Anatolian Fault Zone, the Dead Sea Transform Fault and the Continental Plate Margin um, Fault that stretches to the Gulf of Ukpa and the Cy Cypress Arc. And although we um, know the main fault trace between Karlova in the northeast and Turklo in the southwest, the southwest continuation of this to Cyprus is a bit more debated and less known. The main thing to take away from um, this slide is that the Arabian plate is moving northwards, causing the extrusion of Anatolia to the west, and both the East Anatolian fault zones and the Dead Sea transform faults are left lateral strike slip faults. And a way I like to think about left lateral strike slip motion is that if you're standing on one side of the fault, then the other side is moving to the left, which in this case means if you were standing on the African plate on the south side of the East Anatolian fault, then the Anatolian plate is moving to the left. So next slide, please. In terms of the regional geology, there are three main um, structural features, the first being the bitless Sagra Sutra zone, which marks the boundary between the Arabian and Anatolian uh, plates, and the other two are the previously mentioned Eastern Anatolian and Dead Sea fault zones, which are moving at around 10 millimetres um, and 4 to 15 millimetres a year, respectively. There are five main geological units um, in the region, from the oldest metamorphic basement to the youngest basin sediments, 
And it's in these tectonically controlled basins, such as Antakya, where we've seen um, earthquake ground motion amplification due to the loose sedimentary material. And if we now look at the seismology of the 6th of February earthquakes, um, next slide, please. Then the map on the right illustrates the rupture extents for the two magnitude seven events. The first earthquake rupture shown in the red line on the map happened in the early hours of the night, approximately 35 uh, kilometers west of Gaziantep city in the, on the border with Syria. And this rupture was shallow and initiated along a previously unknown fault um, and propagated onto the east, Eastern Anatolian fault. And there was extreme shaking intensities felt throughout the region from this earthquake. Then, um, nine hours later, another significantly large earthquake occurred, 100 kilometers to the north, along the Sergu Fault, and that's shown in blue on the map. And interestingly, this earthquake ruptured eastwards at a speed that we deem normal for earthquake ruptures, but it also ruptured westwards at extremely fast speeds, which attributed to um, higher ground motions and the damage um, much more damage caused to the cities in the southwest. And both these events were followed by a magnitude 6.3 earthquake on the 20th of February and tens of thousands of aftershocks. So now we'll look at the geomorphology and often the ground off, um, leaves scars behind an earthquake, especially big ones such as these. So after the Karamamarash earthquake sequence, 100 of kilometers of surface ruptures were um, created across the region with up to six meters of um, offset recorded along the East Anatolian fault zones. The hybrid approach that e the EFIT mission um, allowed was for um, the surface rupture observations to be made from both from the satellite imagery shown in the middle um, of the slide here, as well as in the field um, shown by the photo taken by one of our EFIT um, team members. We were able to pick out the horizontal offsets using markers like roads or field boundaries, um, such as that seen in the Maxar imagery um, on the middle of the slide here. And the cartoon on the left um, shows this sequential uh, sense of motion during a left lateral strike slip rupture. Again, if you're on um, one side of the fault, the other side moves to the left relatively. And lastly, um, since the affected area was near the southern coast of Turkey, we analyzed some of the tidal gauge data and a small tsunami with wave heights of 13 to 17 centimeters was recorded at four gauges in southern Turkey and northern Cyprus. But further analysis has um, been carried out on this and the effect was deemed to be um, due to liquefaction and natural spreading. Given the fact that both the Turkish and Italian authorities issued tsunami warnings within 15 minutes of the first earthquake, demonstrates the effectiveness of having this established tsunami early warning system in place, um, even if the warning was later removed and the threat you know, was analyzed and updated. So now I'll pass you off um, to my colleague Fatma, who will present the strong ground motion findings from our earthquake sequence. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Hi, everyone. I will summarize the main characteristics of the strong ground motions. Next, please. Uh, in the region, there is a really well-distributed network. Uh, many stations deployed around the surface rupture of the uh, particularly largest first one is really good opportunity uh, to understand the features of the near-field ground motions. Uh, however, unfortunately, there are some problems in the dissemination of the data. Uh, we checked the Turkish Accelerometric Database website today, and the data is not currently access accessible, unfortunately. Uh, also, recordings of these stations in the photos have some problems in the uh, first earthquake, but their recordings from second earthquake seems to be usable. Uh, that's why our field team inspected the stations and uh, verified there are not uh, any damage in their uh, housing. Next, please. Uh, let's look at the PGA distributions. In the first earthquake, large PGAs are seen, especially on the fault rupture. Uh, the maximum PGA is about 1.5 G, uh, was detected in Hatay, positioned around 150 km away from the epicenter. Uh, however, this station is located on the southwest edge of the fault rupture. Uh, so using the closest distance to the uh, rupture will be more meaningful in the analysis uh, due to the long rupture length. Uh, in the second earthquake, fever stations are are located around the rupture. Uh, the largest PGA is from the closest one at 0.7 G, and the large PGAs are mainly observed in the north of the region. The third and smallest event is prominent in Hatay with about uh, 0.5 G of maximum uh, PGA. Next, please. 
Uh, what else we have seen in the recordings? Uh, in the first source case, uh, we have detected multi-wave patterns in 27 stations. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, according to Melgar, this is related to the time difference between a uh, rupture of the segment. Uh, in three closest stations to the epicenter, uh, PJs are seen in the first wave pattern, while for others uh, in the second wave pattern, which seems to uh, have longer period content. Uh, on the right, we can see spectral ratios, uh, which is the ratio of the spectral acceleration uh, of uh, softer side to stiffer side, and uh, generally point out to amplification probably due, due to basin effect because it, uh, they, are, uh, they are from the Antakya basin. Uh, we can see this uh, in the first and third event and at specific periods. Uh, you, can, you can see the bumps in these periods of response spectra for the uh, cetacean common recording, both first and third earthquake. Uh, interestingly, maximum spectral accelerations of larger and smaller events provide similar values at uh, one second as about 2G. Uh, so we can say Antakya Basin were probably exposed to similar level of spectral accelerations twice. Next, please. Also, peculiar uh, features are seen in velocities. Uh, for first earthquake, the green arrows on the map uh, display the direction, display the directions uh, of maximum velocities and point out generally, generally fast normal directions. Uh, however, in uh, stations close to the epicenter and uh, especially Antakya Basin, orientations are a little bit complicated. Uh, also, in both uh, first and second event, uh, near field velocities show the directive effects uh, resulting in long period large velocity pulses. Uh, on the right, you can see the time histories giving the maximum velocity and potential effects uh, on its response spectra for first earthquake. Uh, as a result of all these findings, uh, long period structures may have significantly affected by these phenomena. Next, please. Uh, also, the spectral accelera accelerations were compared with the latest building earthquake code of Turkey. A comparison was made for two earthquake levels. Uh, DD1 corresponds to maximum constant earthquake and mainly used uh, in the design of the tall buildings. DD2 is the standard design earthquake, which is generally used in the design of the conventional uh, residential buildings. So for the first earthquake, you can see PGA comparison plot on the top left, uh, and uh, it displayed that particularly many near field PJs give larger values than SDE levels. Uh, the response spectra given the, given the uh, largest SA also surpassed uh, even uh, maximum concert earthquake level. Uh, the period range of exceedances of MCE code spectra uh, were investigated for all stations of first earthquake, and the map on the right expressed that uh, exceedances were detected particularly in the near fault recordings in different period range. Uh, in other two earthquakes, similar trends are valid FF stations. Next, please. The field team uh, reported that many locals mentioned the vertical movement, uh, especially during the first earthquake. Uh, this is so consistent consistent with our findings, and the notable vertical accelerations were record recorded particularly in the first event. Uh, please look left of the slide. Uh, the largest vertical PJ exceeds 1G and uh, 1.5 times larger than the geometric mean of horizontal. Uh, there are also several stations whose ratio of vertical to horizontal are greater than 1. Uh, the map on the right shows that vertical spectra of first earthquake surpasses the MCE code spectra uh, along a wide period range. Uh, this shows us the vertical elements of structures such as uh, columns probably were exposed to unexpected vertical forces. Uh, the field team confirmed this finding and also will elaborate in their section. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I'm giving the floor Orestes to explain geotechnical observations. Thank you very much. So um, I'm Orestes Adamidis from the University of Oxford, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, geotechnical observations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, right, so the geotechnical team, um, it has covered quite a large area in the days where uh, when we were in Turkey. You can see here all of the areas we visited. We started from the Skenderun area, uh, then went towards the Antakya region, moved up towards Slahiye, Pazarcik made, made our way to Gölbaşı, where there was a lot of um, geotechnical uh, failures. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, right, thank you. So um, the way uh, we've structured the observations is, oh, sorry, just one before. 
Uh, is first we're going to talk about uh, landslides and rock fault and fault interaction with structures, liquefaction and subsidence, and then I'm going to pass it on to uh, Thelma Neferglu from the University of Bristol to talk to you about bridge foundations and retaining structures. All right, so let's start with landslides. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so first the uh, uh, virtual team uh, had already looked at satellite images and identified areas of rockfall and landslides around Islahia, and you can see them on, on the left. Um, and we visited these areas. Uh, first, the area of the rockfall, we, and, oh, I'm not sure what's happening with the slides. So uh, let's just go, yes, the next slide. Uh, yes, right, thank you. So um, first, the area where uh, virtually we observed uh, rockfall and landslides, you can see the crest of a landslide and how it has uh, blocked a railway line. And then in that region, we had quite a large extent of a relatively shallow um, mechanism that was activated along the whole slope. Next slide, please. Um, in this region, we also had uh, significant uh, rockfalls. Uh, observed uh, large sizes of rocks, and you can see that um, they had interfered with uh, electrical line infrastructure and uh, water pipes, um, and there were multiple of these roads. We were informed that the road was also closed uh, initially, and the electricity was affected for a couple of weeks. Next slide, please. Um, right, and then in area A, where a large landslide was identified virtually through satellite images, we were able to visit that and verify that this was indeed a very large landslide. We had a drone, so we were able to fly over it, and what we observed was that a significant, actually, lake had formed, so the landslide was act acting as a natural dam, and in the picture on the left side of your screen, perhaps you can see at the bottom left that there's already some water going through that natural dam. So there's already piping and erosion going on, which meant that uh, the conditions were, were quite hazardous. So we had to inform the local authorities because this was just upstream of Islahi and there was a danger of um, uh, a failure happening. Next slide, please. Um, right, and then um, we saw cases of fault interaction with structures. Uh, this was particularly visible in the area of Gyolbashi, and you can see that initially the virtual uh, team had identified areas of surface rupture, they had mapped them uh, on the surface, and you can see that there's, there are lines going towards Gyolbashi and then continuing after that. Next slide, please. Um, when we were actually there in Gyolbashi, we were able to uh, track these lines, and as you see on the top of your screen, we were able to add to what was done virtually. Um, by adding this uh, additional uh, purple lines uh, going into the city. And then um, within the city, some of the lines we mapped, they were going through actual um, uh, buildings. So you can see here a sequence of two photos. One is actually right next to the other. They were taken by drone. And you can see that there is a surface rupture that's going through the whole built area. And we'll see that better in the next slide uh, when we focus on one of these two pictures. Um, Right, and here you can see that uh, the surface rupture has gone around the first building. Uh, I should say that all of these buildings had stiff rough foundations and the soil uh, seemed like it had quite a bit of plasticity, it seemed rather soft. So what uh, happened is that the surface rupture was diverted by the presence of the structures. And so you can see on the left-hand side, it went around the first building, then went um, just next to the series of buildings after that, through two neighboring buildings that you see in the third image. These two buildings were originally before the earthquake touching and continued on the uh, waterway that you see on the fourth picture and then crossed the road and kept going. Uh, we were also able to go to a village close to Gyolbashi called Ozan, and you can see the um, satellite again image on the top with a mapped surface rupture. And we found a structure there that was right on the surface rupture. And similarly to um, what was described in uh, the previous presentation, this is a strike slip. So we had um, significant horizontal movement. You can see that the structure again, the stiff rough foundation stayed on one half of the soil and then um, one half of the side that moved. And then the other half uh, has a lateral mo movement of 160 centimeters relative to it. And we also observed a vertical movement of 80 centimeters. Now, the next slide is a, is a throwback to a previous uh, IFIT mission from the 99 earthquake in uh, Chichi, where, again, a building on surface rupture 
this time on much stiffer soil uh, uh, the, the, where the surface rupture could not be diverted by the presence of, of the structure like we saw in Turkey. Next slide, please. Um, right, so the next section is liquefaction and subsidence. So the areas that were identified by the virtual team were was uh, around the seafront in Iskenderun and around the Orontes River in Antakya. We visited these two, but we also saw a lot of um, widespread liquefaction in uh, Gyolbash in the Northeast. Next slide, please. Right, so you had the um, expected uh, manifestations of liquefaction with uh, sun boiling, ex uh, ejected material at the surface. Um, in Iskenderun, there was very significant subsidence happening due to um, densification of post liquefaction, but also the sea walls had moved uh, towards the sea. And you can see in the bottom right pictures where parts of uh, the, the coastal area are now underwater. Uh, and then at the top, you see some of the walls in Iskenderun and on the right hand side, um, a park by the lake in Gyolbashi, where again we had a lot of spreading. Next, sli next slide, please. So um, again, we observed uh, we observed many structures in these er in these areas. As expected, there was significant settlement, significant rotation, as you see for the one um, in the in the top picture. This was in an area that spread close to the Orontes River. Um, structures that were single story, but also uh, bigger structures had significant settlement. Next slide, please. So the next slide should be from the area of uh, Gyolbashi where there was a significant part of the town that was affected by liquefaction. These structures, again, mostly had stiff um, rough foundation, uh, rough foundations, uh, significant settlement observed, and uh, the structures with a higher um, aspect ratio uh, had uh, some tilting, as you can see here. Next slide, please. And I believe in the next slide, uh, you'll see some more pictures from Gilbersi, right? Uh, sorry, it has a bit of a return for me. Um, so here again, we had very significant settlement, but structures with a lower aspect ratio, they had less tilting than the structures with a higher aspect ratio in the previous slide. Right, and now I'll pass it on to Teoman for bridge foundations and the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much, Orestes, for the opportunity. I'll start with the bridge foundation and approach structures. These cases are from the area of Antakya and Pazarcik. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an interesting case of a null bridge that has collapsed right next to the new bridge that remains intact. As you can observe, there is no structural damage to the piers. This is mainly settlement and the tilting of the foundations resulted in the collapse of the decks. So therefore, uh, this is failure of the foundation system and uh, not a structural failure. But of course, the structural design of the new bridge and the bearings that were used allowed the uh, pier and the deck to move independently. This was not the case for the old bridge and collapse. Next slide, please. This is another bridge that we found in Antakya, next to Antakya Stadium. It's a five spans bridge on the river Karasu. This bridge did have some structural failures, bearings that, uh, that fell down and uh, the plastic hinge can be seen in the photo in the upper right corner. But I want to focus on the geotechnical failure related to uh, instability of the slopes at the bridge approach. Uh, this is shown clearly in the bottom photos where the back wall of the uh, bridge moved and they tilted. Also, the inclination was observed on the pillars as the foundation moved uh, towards the river. Uh, in this case, fortunately, the bearings accommodated all this displacement uh, and uh, the deck uh, didn't collapse. Uh, next slide, please. This one is an embankment failure. This is an area uh, close to village Every in Pazarcik. It's a typical case of uh, seismic slope stability. It might look like lateral spreading and uh, be related to liquefaction, uh, but there were no indications of liquefaction in the area. This is a slope stability problem instead, which seems to be connected to uh, existence of a uh, waterway uh, that you can see in the picture. And uh, this, uh, the existence of the waterway created a point of weakness at that side of the slope uh, that resulted in a failure. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the case of retaining structures from the Orontes Riverside area in uh, Antakya. Uh, and I'm going to close with this. There were failures on both sides of the river. On the left, you can see retaining wall failures on both sides. The photos in the middle and the one on the right show the same point from different perspectives. 
Here, I would say that you have a series of independent walls. You can see that there is no connection between them. So the ones that freely stood collapsed and uh, you can see the active wedge from behind them. Um, also significant displacement was observed in the ones uh, closer to the bridge, but apparently the bridge acted like a prop, not allowing the retaining wall to collapse at that location. Thank you very much. Now I kindly leave the stage to the structure team. Thanks, Theo. Hi, everyone. As mentioned, uh, I'm Turcia Tetik from Structure Team. Uh, today, I will talk about reinforced concrete buildings on behalf of the Structure Team. Uh, and in the presentation, I'm going to basically focus on the damage types. I have five minutes, so firstly, we'll cover my part. Uh, we know that there are significant updates in the earthquake building codes from 1947 to 2018, due to the resource on fault lines, ground survey, variable modern structural modeling, and material types, risk and hazard studies. And as an important case is the post earthquake observations, uh, because Turkey was exposure to two destructive earthquakes in 99. Uh, after that, Turkey produced additional regularities related to construction details uh, in 2000 and buildings inspection. Uh, building inspection after 2001 was applied to only 19 provinces, including Adana, Gaziantep, and also Hatay. Uh, but after 2011, it was started to apply to all provinces in Turkey. Next slide, please. Let's see the numerical way of this. Almost half of the structures were constructed after 2001 in the disaster area and uh, reinforced concrete uh, buildings constitutes 87% uh, of the structures. Next slide, please. Our field team visited many villages and provinces in the disaster area to collect data. Here is uh, our red path in the field work, uh, including Hatay, uh, Osmaniye, Kahraman Maraş, and also Adıyaman. Next slide, please. And here is the damage assessment. Uh, the left side data was recorded and published by the ministry. And the right side data was collected to our field team. Uh, we see the remarkable difference on especially moderate damage. So uh, we need to compare our methods to there uh, to figure out why, uh, why we got different damage results. Uh, so we can pass the next slide. Let's look at the rebar and concrete details uh, because uh, inadequate reinforcement arrangements such as uh, using the smooth rounded bars, uh, stir ups to be formed with uh, 90 degrees hooks instead of 135 degrees, uh, the absence of stir ups in the column beam junctions and also keeping overlap length short uh, are the important cause of uh, damages. Next slide, please. Uh, also, the lack of uh, appropriate granulometry in concrete production, uh, such as the use of only river gravel in the material use, uh, the absence of crushed stones uh, cause low concrete strength. So uh, using problematic uh, concrete rebar details results with the uh, endurance problem in reinforced concrete elements. Uh, you, see, you see the removing uh, rebar from concrete in the bottom pictures also. Next slide, please. Uh, because of low deformation capacity, we see the uh, cracks and also, next slide, please. Fallings of infill walls. Next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, you see the short column beha behavior because of architectural design problems, uh, such as ribbon windows, windows uh, that are made from column to column of structure. Uh, so ground shaking caused brittle fractures in columns. Uh, next slide, please. And here, uh, damaged floors present a significant lower stiffness and strength than the other flats uh, due to the design problems or uh, an awesome elimination reduction in number of uh, rigid non-structural walls in the floors. Uh, so we uh, encountered uh, soft and weak story problems. Next slide, please. And so let's see the earthquake induced uh, pounding damage in adjacent buildings of different heads. 
because we know that buildings with uh, different heads uh, have particular dynamic parameters such as uh, periods, resonance frequencies, and also mode shapes. Uh, so uh, due to the insufficient separa separation distance between structures, we encountered these damages. Uh, next slide, please. And here is the torsional irregularities because of uh, column replacement errors and also problematic reinforcement arrangements. Uh, we see the knife cuts uh, pattern damage on columns. And again, we see the poorly constructed buildings suffered collapse, uh, collapse mode. As mentioned, Fatima, uh, due to the vertical earthquake acceleration to very high levels, uh, column damage occurred as a result of the uh, uh, excessive increase in axial pressure force, uh, especially in the ground floor, floor columns of the uh, building, like the pictures. Next, next slide, please. Also, you see the, another example of exceedance or earthquake design levels in Bektaşlı, uh, near the Balarmada station. Uh, so uh, now that's my all. I'm going to turn over to SR Çabuk to explain retrofitted buildings and also Turkey. Hello, everyone. I am SR Çabuk, uh, and I will talk about the, about the buildings which performed well. Uh, which are specifically retrofitted buildings and also Tokyo buildings. Uh, the first one is Antakya Municipality Residentials. So there were three buildings uh, in this uh, residential complex. Uh, these were almost 50 years old and uh, there were three blocks with, with the identical plan and some of them retrofitted uh, according to the 2007 seismic code, which is the previous one. So the left block, which is the A2, uh, the external shield walls are, were added to the building and also uh, in the infill walls inside the, inside the building, uh, the carbon fiber reinforced polymer application uh, was conducted and also uh, the polymer was also applied to the inner columns uh, and it was throughout the building. Uh, and there's another block uh, in the right uh, it's also retrofitted, but on only in the ground floor. So uh, they also they uh, added in some infill walls to the empty frames, and they also applied again the CFRP in the in the inner columns, and it also survived. There was another block uh, which were the which is at the top of the picture, but it's collapsed. Sorry, I, I couldn't find the before the earthquake picture. Next, please. Uh, now, this is the CFRP application uh, in the infill walls. Uh, they apply the polymer and then they also anchor it to the beams and the slab. So it works with the, uh, with the frame. And on the right, uh, we see they wrap the CFRP on the columns and uh, it it enhances the shear, shear uh, capacity of the column. Next, please. Uh, this is the addition of the external shear walls. Uh, on the left picture, uh, we can see the excavation. Uh, it's for the connection between the shear walls and the foundation. And uh, in the middle picture, we can see the how they anchor the shear wall uh, and at the right picture, uh, we see the wall uh, and we can differentiate the wall from the outside. Uh, this building uh, survived, but it's all heavily damaged, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it satisfied the life safety performance. Next, please. Yeah, the, this, is the another, this is another example in Fevzi Pasha Station in Gaziantep. Uh, there were historical masonry buildings, uh, maybe a dozen of buildings. These were used for both management and residential purposes for the station workers. Uh, in the top, uh, in the right pictures, you can see the, uh, the buildings before the earthquake. And 
uh, in the below at the bottom, uh, you can see one building uh, survived thanks to the CFRP retrofitting. Um, other buildings could not be retrofitted because they were uh, classified as heritage buildings as in the law. So they cannot be retrofitted, but only can be renovated. Yeah, this is the building and there were some uh, non-structural damage in the building. Uh, some infill wall uh, crack between the beam and also some hole. Uh, and I think there were some equipment uh, hanging in the wall and there was a hole there. But it's overall, uh, the building was very good and it's, people could still live inside. But other buildings, uh, other than this, uh, they were all collapsed. Next, please. Another example which performed good during the earthquake is the Toki buildings. These are not retrofitted buildings, uh, but Toki is a governmental manager for mass housing. Uh, it consists of maybe three to five percent of the total housing in the earthquake region. Uh, they are mostly constructed with tunnel formworks and uh, with, with the tunnel formworks there's high percentage of the shear walls so uh, which uh, also enhanced the, the uh, earthquake earthquake strength and they performed well uh, there were not uh, high damages so ne in the next slide please so yeah, these are some damages taken from these buildings. Uh, the left one was uh, is a corrosion in the reinforcement. This is not earthquake related. Uh, in the middle one, we can see some non-structural damage. And in the right, uh, we can see some concrete covers falling and also uh, some infill wall cracks. But overall, these buildings were okay. Next, please. So as a conclusion, uh, these are good examples the, that uh, retrofit works and also that it complies life, surf, life safety performance level, even uh, if it's retrofitted uh, according to the previous code. Uh, so buildings with more shear walls, uh, which was the example of Tokyo buildings, they performed relatively better than other, other residential buildings. Uh, these retro, while these retrofitted uh, were conducted, res residents could still live in the building, so they can be, uh, and they also work uh, even only applied to the ground floor, uh, which also could be uh, reasonable, cost effective and also time effective. But it's also important to remember that uh, these any retrofit technique is not miracle. Uh, every structure has its own uh, limitation, and uh, sometimes it's it's worth uh, retrofitting the building. Sometimes it's not, so it should be selected. Uh, it's an engineering decision. And thank you. Uh, from now on, uh, I think Viviana will take the stage. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Good evening to everyone. My name is Viviana. I am from uh, Cardiff University. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, in this section, um, I will start to describe in the traditional construction, and we will look at how these buildings differ from big city to small villages. So the picture shows Antakya, a town with an intense urban contest characterized by many modern construction. Next, please. The town also has a variety of remarkable, unique traditional houses. And here you have a picture of Cortulus Avenue, one of the main streets in the town, before and after the earthquake. Next, please. The damage level is widespread. Buildings are heavily damaged or completely collapsed. But to understand why traditional construction were catastrophically affected by these earthquakes, it is important to understand and identify the typical typologies. Next, please. Three main typologies can be identified. A reinforced masonry building with bearing walls, with bricks or stones, timber bands or frames with or without bracing elements, 
filled with stones or bricks and hybrid systems with a first level made of bearing walls and a second level with timber masonry systems. Next, please. Flory can, uh, uh, flory can also vary from timber structures to vaults, uh, to simple reinforced concrete slabs, uh, to reinforced concrete slabs supported by steel eye beams. Uh, the observed high variety in the typologies also indicates that many of these structures have been alterated over time, when it can, which can lead to fatal vulnerability. Next, please. One of the major causes of these failures, particularly for structures made of bearing walls, is the use of irregular stones within the wall lift. Due to the irregularity of this rubble, the wall lift can often separate and lead to roof collapse, auto paint failures of single elements, auto paint failures of entire facade, overturning of corners, and separation coins that are not able to strengthen the connection of the walls. Other weakness have been also observed because of pounding, construction of additional floors, replacement of the original floors, and absence of connection between partition walls and bearing walls. This weakness can exaggerate the vulnerability of these systems. Next, please. We also spent a couple of days exploring villages as we felt the, that more information was needed to overcome the lack of available, available data on these areas. As we move into villages, we see that the building topologies are very similar. We have buildings with uh, UN buildings with uh, uh, bearing walls, uh, timber mensory frames with flexible flooring made of timber, timber with straw or metal sheets. As lime cement is prevalent in town, mud mortar is prevalent in villages. Also, bearing walls are very often made with dry stones, so in absence of mortar. In villages, lack of maintenance observed on site has accelerated the degradation of materials and the overall condition of these buildings. Moreover, this construction very often in villages are vacant. In many cases, the damage observed was pre-existing to the earthquake. Next, please. This type of construction uh, reflects the Turkey's long history of experienced severe damage, severe earthquakes. These buildings incorporate earthquake resistant features such as timbering beams per floor, uh, timber lintels, corner joint detailing, and dia dia diagonal elements within the frames. These detailings have proven in the past to be effective in withstanding earthquakes. Gaining an understanding of these traditional techniques can inform local construction guidelines and preserve local seismic culture. Next, please. In the next slide, we will see some failures in this construction that demonstrated the loss of rubble in the wall leaf lead to collapse of entire facade, particularly in construction made of bearing walls. Additionally, arch failures occur very often at roof level. Such failures are due to the lateral forces exerted on the rafters with push against bearing walls in the direction parallel to the earthquake. Traditional buildings with seismic resistant features, such as timber bands or uh, corner details, have localized damage but still met the life safety requirements. In the next slide, you are going to see like some typical failures that are observed for masonry construction. We are talking about auto pain failures due to the lack of connection between bearing walls or uh, lack of connection between wearing walls and partition walls. Also, uh, the combination of auto pain failures and in pain failures. In villages, there are not only traditional, house, traditional houses, but also many buildings or one or two story made of reinforced concrete or confined masonry. It is common to see also, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, large scale developments where houses are built in series, series using similar typologies. These buildings, although they have various uh, irregularities have shown to perform quite well during the earthquakes. Next, please. Village, the prevalence of irregular construction built using hybrid system in villages 
pose a significant risk to the uh, safety of the communities. On the left, we have, um, you can see a bearing wall system made of three materials, adobe, stones, and clay bricks. While on the right, we have a building that the first level is made of imported, reinforced concrete frames, and the second and third level as is made with bearing walls with rigid concrete diaphragm. Next, please. The last buildings that uh, you see in this slide uh, is a unique example made of reinforced concrete steel system infilled with clay bricks where the regularity is broken by beams and columns which are uh, not continuous. It is crucial to assess this type of construction, not only after an earthquake, but in a particular way before an earthquake. Unfortunately, existing methods not always are adequate to tackle the complexity of the system, and suitable rapid visual assessment method needs to be developed to inspect the safety of the structures. Now I'm going to pass the floor to Kokshan that will talk about monumental buildings. Uh, thank you, Viviana. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kokshan, and I'm going to uh, introduce our uh, results and share our uh, preliminary assessments for monumental structures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in South Turkey, heritage structures belong to four main eras, uh, while Hellenic and Eastern Roman monuments haven't suffered from extensive damage. Uh, Ottoman or earlier public structures were significantly damaged in 2020 earthquake sequence. Uh, as a general observation, most monumental structures predating the uh, 19th century earthquakes in Hatay survived the recent earthquakes as well. Uh, however, 19th and 20th century monuments suffered from uh, significant damage. Based on uh, our remote and initiative studies, we focused on the, these monumental structures on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the region, monumental structures are mostly unreinforced masonry load bearing typologies with uh, multi leaf stone walls with variations such as ashlar or rubble faced, rubble infilled, mortared or ashlar coins. Their roofs are of mostly timber, steel, or concrete, and their uh, masonry units vary within a wide, wide range spectrum uh, from cut stone, uh, mostly observed in autumn mosques. Uh, autumn structures or in general to irregular uh, rubble texture. Uh, wall disintegration common uh, due to lack of internal tying or crack inhibiting elements, for example, uh, iron clamps, pins, or uh, timber lintels, uh, which leads to uh, local out of plane failures. Next slide, please. We have conducted uh, detailed investigations for uh, damage uh, and extensive data collection. We aim to understand structural morphology in the region and the impact of devastating earthquake sequence, uh, especially we aim to distinguish the effects of earthquakes on February 6 and February 20. Additionally, using laser scanning and photogrammetry, we investigated uh, numerous churches and mosques. And in this regard, we intend to provide technical support to local stakeholders. Next slide, please. Uh, based on our preliminary remote research and briefing from local contacts, aforementioned investigations uh, mostly focused on monumental structures with religious or public, public functions in uh, seriously affected areas. Our team evaluated 28 monumental structures that suffered from moderate damage to destruction. Uh, verbal statements of locals indicated that the mean moderate damage in Iskenderun and the mean very heavy damage in Antakya were mainly due to the 7.88 earthquake. And on the other hand, uh, the 6.3 Samanda earthquake on February 20 substantially increased the level of damage to monuments and led to several world failures and uh, out of plane failures of cycles in Samanda and Altunuzu. Next slide, please. As a general floor roof typology observation, on left hand side, you can see an example of rigid diaphragm and uh, associated damage mechanism observed in Enverul Hamid Mosque in Osmania. The mosque has uh, reinforced concrete slab galleries and roof cover, and such rigid diaphragm prevents out of plane failure and uh, leads in plane cracking, as in our example. However, uh, an example of flexible diaphragm in a school building in Iskenderun, first floor reinforced concrete and second floor uh, of timber, uh, exhibited an extensive out of plane damage mechanism. Next slide, please. Field observations on walls and domes led us 
a couple of main conclusions. Common wall typologies are barrel or cross stone constructions. Uh, cross stone walls and domes with ramps are appeared to be vulnerable to damage. We have two examples from Antakya mosques. The total collapse of the central dome and interior walls in Habib Nejjar mosque. Uh, another near example is Sheikh Ali mosque. Uh, its central dome was uh, almost totally collapsed above the drum and its cross stone wall prevented, prevented the collapse, however, uh, suffered from heritage. And uh, this is all for now from our side. And I'm going to pass the floor to Remote Sensing team. Thank you. All right. So um, let's move toward the remote sensing uh, activities that we perform in this uh, reconnaissance mission. Um, I'm Pietro Mirillo from uh, the University of Houston and affiliated with the German Space Agency. Next slide, please. So as part of the remote sensing group, we have two objectives. The first one is to assist and help ground-based teams to uh, understand and choosing the best areas where to conduct field surveys. And the second objective is focused more on actually developing and validating a framework that could actually tell us something on what's the best uh, remote sensing approach and what's the best methodology um, that uh, we could use in, the, in, in these events for um, earthquake response. Next slide, please. So these are a few of the activities that we performed during the um, remote uh, mission and during the um, field mission. First of all, we created a da database of uh, available damage products provided by space agency, public institutions, and private companies. We also assessed uh, what kind of satellite data sets are available and uh, what kind of techniques uh, we are able or we will be able to apply uh, for damage uh, mapping from space. <clears throat> and specifically, we are targeting uh, observations that include optical, LIDAR, and radar sensors. We also um, provided uh, actionable descriptive products that include, for instance, building count, building area, average height per uh, province uh, district uh, in order to help grant the ground-based response. And uh, our job was also to connect uh, with private uh, satellite vendor in order to acquire data while the ground-based survey was uh, in action. Next slide, please. So here um, you have a, a slide presenting um, some of the damage maps provided by um, ESA, NASA, <clears throat> companies like Planet Labs, but also some uh, damage maps that we uh, created uh, as a part of the remote sensing effort. So um, here, this is basically uh, telling us that we have a plethora of damage um, remote sensing ba based damage products. And now we would like to use these products in order to have an informed decision on what are the most important areas that the ground-based team should survey. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we have a flow chart that shows uh, the kind of data set that we used and we produced and how we ended up then choosing the priority areas for the ground based team to visit. So we start with a global footprint map that includes um, building height and building area. And we pair this with the Microsoft and OpenStreetMap um, building uh, shape files that helped us counting the number of buildings for uh, province. And um, in the red uh, square here, you could see the maps that we produced that show the number of buildings, the average height per district, the average building age per district. And we pair these uh, pre-existing maps with um, damage maps. And in particular, we uh, were interested in areas that are in provinces that are characterized by a diversity of damage levels. This is just because uh, we are also interested in assessing the accuracy of our algorithms and the sensitivity to uh, specific damage classes. And so we came out and we provided some final recommendations to the ground-based teams. We selected some high priority areas characterized by diversity, of uh, height, building site, diversity of uh, building age, and also diversity of building damage. Next slide. And so the ongoing activities are focused on reconciliating the remote sensing data set and the official assessments from the uh, government. Also we'll run our methodologies and our algorithms for producing damage uh, maps using optical, LIDAR, and radar data. 
And then um, the third part will be focusing on validating our algorithms with the ground-based uh, uh, measurements. And this ends uh, the remote sensing um, section. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to everyone. My name is Anton Andonov. I work for Mott McDonald and I will present our preliminary findings on the infrastructure response after this uh, sequence of earthquakes on behalf of our team. Uh, so in this presentation and also in the field mission, we concentrated our efforts mainly on the infrastructure that has critical function immediately after the earthquake so that the infrastructure that is needed for adequate uh, response and relief uh, efforts. So I will speak more on the slides related to this infrastructure and we will uh, go very quickly through the other slides uh, to save uh, time. But in the report, the all types of infrastructure will be covered with a similar level of detail. So I will start with uh, probably the worst example of infrastructure performance after this uh, earthquake, namely the healthcare infrastructure. Uh, about 30% uh, of the hospitals in that uh, affected region were damaged beyond repair. So that's either collapsed or, or severely damaged and they were non-functional uh, after the earthquake and also in long term. That of course uh, had a significant influence on the um, capability to, uh, to, to, uh, to respond to, to that uh, event which doesn't mean that the other hospitals were functional, but I'll speak for them uh, later in the slides. The examples here from two uh, hospitals that collapsed, one is the state hospital in Iskenderun, and uh, this on the bottom is uh, the university hospital in Antakya. They were subjected to very different uh, strong growth motion. My colleagues earlier explained uh, more uh, about that. So the one in Antakya was probably subjected to uh, to a ground motion that was much above the, the seismic uh, uh, design demand that were used, but the one in Skandrum uh, were not subjected to a significant seismic intensity. And by the way, the surrounding buildings uh, around that hospital were in a relatively good shape. Uh, so that is uh, a favor, uh, let's say, of the of the design, like a philosophy. So uh, next slide, please. Yes, as I mentioned, even uh, in, in many locations while we, uh, while we were traveling, uh, we saw hospitals that were structurally intact, but non-functional uh, due to structural or non-structural damage that was preventing them to uh, open and operate. On the right side, you see example from another state hospital. This one is in Nurdak, uh, where the emergency functions were transferred to a tent uh, outside, two tents actually and no other functions were performed from this hospital. So once the, um, the emergency was over with uh, treating injured people, which were not possible with this one, uh, the hospital is not functioning also for normal cases and people need to travel uh, long distances to get uh, care. But my colleagues will speak more on this on the next slides, uh, on the next section for relief. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's on the left side is another example of a newly built and modern hospital that was out of service after the earthquake. In that case is the state hospital in uh, the Hatay State Hospital, which is with over 1,000 beds uh, capacity. Again, due to uh, structural and non-structural uh, favor, mainly non-structural favor, it was not functional and its services were uh, delivered through a huge uh, field hospital in, in the park uh, zone. And I will finish the section with uh, healthcare infrastructure with uh, a positive example, uh, the state hospital in uh, Dorcho that, uh, that is base isolated and uh, remained uh, fully functional uh, after the earthquake. As well, other three hospitals in the region, uh, like uh, the one in Osmanie, Malatia, and uh, LB uh, Next slide, please. The other uh, areas that we looked with more detail were the uh, facilities uh, needed for emergency response. Uh, so fire stations in particular, um, buildings of AFAT. Uh, uh, fire stations were covered in the statistics uh, as part of the municipal services buildings together with the police. And on overall, again, about 25% of the buildings or in that case, they reported the data through usable area. So it was damaged beyond uh, repair and non-functional in the long term. And another 30% were not functional in the short term because they needed to be repaired in order uh, to restart operations. 
Uh, the extreme case of failure uh, uh, that we saw was the, actually we didn't saw because the debris were removed, but that the failure of the central fire station in Antakya that uh, uh, fortunately didn't kill any of the of the firefighters, but the, it demolished, uh, uh, damaged uh, important equipment, fire trucks, but more important in this case, it damaged uh, specialized search and rescue trucks and equipment that were very needed uh, in that particular moment. Next slide, please. Also, when we uh, next slide. So when we were traveling around uh, different cities and we were looking on other fire stations, we saw uh, cases like the one in Iskenderum, given here as example, of fire stations that were structurally intact, but because of no structural uh, damage, they were evacuated. And again, like the example with the hospitals, services were delivered from uh, tents outside. So that was the dispatcher, the commander, and also the sleeping quarter of the personnel. Everything was intense. And uh, fortunately, there were also good examples. The one is uh, here on, on the bottom right is from Kahran Manmaraj Central Fire Station, which despite some light damage in the infill walls, uh, remained functional through the entire, uh, all the time after the, the earthquake. Next slide, please. Uh, on the transport uh, uh, sector, we uh, didn't spend uh, uh, many efforts, mainly because we knew that uh, all uh, uh, major damages were uh, repaired, but on overall, the, the transport sector uh, performed very well. Uh, and uh, yes, and uh, all the disturbances were uh, solved in the first uh, one, two days after the earthquake. On overall, the, the losses reported were about 1.4 billion uh, pounds and half of these uh, uh, losses due to the damage in the railway sector. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, quickly just uh, showing some examples of damage on road that we observed uh, at the field. And ne next slide, please. I'm cautious about the time. As I mentioned, all, uh, on all major transport corridors, damage were uh, rec um, repaired uh, soon after the earthquake. And my colleagues also uh, presented uh, uh, a bit of information about bridges, but no damage on major bridges on major transport corridors were reported. So what we see was like a secondary uh, roads and uh, damage of bridges on secondary roads. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a very famous case, uh, which everyone uh, have seen uh, in the media. So that was the port of Iskenderun. Actually, there was uh, limited damage reported on uh, on uh, parts of the quay, but uh, the port was not in operation for a couple of days due to large fire. And uh, what we uh, heard also on the field is that uh, many of these fire stations in the nearby area was actually very busy on search and rescue activities and dealing with uh, smaller fires within the cities. So there was no enough capacity. Next slide, please. Electricity uh, was lost uh, immediately after the earthquake almost uh, in the entire region, but uh, the supply of electricity uh, was recovered with different pace in different uh, zones. So in the less affected uh, regions, they managed to recover electricity supply in a couple of hours after the earthquake. But in Antakya, uh, people say that uh, they didn't have electricity for four days. And, and this can be seen in the in the in these um, night satellite pictures of Antakya and the, uh, the lighting. So a report uh, a lot of damage were reported on the uh, transmission uh, electricity transmission system. So about ten percent that four thousand megawatt ampere uh, is the ten percent of the installed capacity of the uh, of the transmission uh, lines. So it's more or less the power needed to supply 3 million uh, people. But uh, everything was damaged in the uh, in few days after the earthquake. So uh, next slide, please. So there was no damage in substations, uh, no remaining damaged substations when we were on field. So what we see and what we include in the report will be based on uh, review of information available uh, in internet. Next slide, please. But uh, what we've seen uh, in Antarctica, in many uh, places, were damaged of low and medium voltage uh, transformer stations. 
uh, and also we, we, we were seeing similar type of damage in other places as well, but not that intensive as Antakya. Next slide, please. Yes, we uh, managed to visit one of the, uh, of, the, of the main power plants in the region. So that's the Afsin Elbistan uh, power station. So there are two stations, each one 0.4 gigawatts. Both of them were out of operation after the earthquake. So already seven or eight weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, in terms of structural damage, we saw minor damage in, the, in station B that we visited. But next slide, uh, please. But there were a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there were sufficient, uh, there were damage in the mechanical and the process system actually that prevented the station from uh, restarting operation. So there's a significant financial loss uh, accumulated uh, every day. Next slide. Uh, we haven't visited gas pipelines, but uh, again, based on uh, uh, Available information, there were over 20 different points with natural gas explosions. We will cover this in more detail in the report. Next slide, please. Water, it's not, uh, supply of water is not uh, reestablished in many uh, locations. And the overall damage in the water and sanitation uh, utilities is about 650 million uh, pounds. And in many uh, cities, the water is supplied to citizens in the form of bottled water with this type of trucks. Next slide, please. Uh, damages in industry, we, we saw mainly concentrated in old, uh, um, uh, old factories and, and storage facilities. And also in many locations, we saw damaged uh, silos. That's example from Nurdagi, where all elevated silos collapsed. And the one uh, that is flat bottom, they were damaged to a level that uh, they couldn't evacuate the grain uh, in the normal means. So they needed to cut the operational staff needed to cut in the walls in order to save their investments. Next slide, please. Uh, we saw in several places a uh, failure of precast industrial buildings, but that was mainly um, all of them. Almost all of them were in still in the construction stage, and then uh, they have lateral, uh, lack of lateral stability in that stage. Next slide, please. And I would like to finish with something positive that is in particular the response of schools in uh, after this earthquake. So the, the, the collapse rate, the, the rate of uh, schools that were, um, that collapsed or was severely damaged is just about 6% of all schools assessed so far, and are likely to, to grow as a percentage. So that is, few times less than uh, what was observed in the residential building stock and even in critical facilities like uh, big uh, hospitals and, and fire stations. And one of the potential reasons that we'll explore further in the report is that uh, Turkey uh, committed uh, 15 years ago to make, uh, to seismically strengthen all uh, schools. And as of uh, by 2015, they strengthened about 70% of the school buildings in Turkey. So that's uh, a likely reason for that good Performance. Next slide, please. Uh, so we rarely uh, we were seeing uh, damaged schools quite rarely, and mainly in uh, old stone masonry schools, and mainly in the most left, most affected region of Hatay. Uh, you see here some example of damage on uh, last slide. The next slide, please, which is my last slide. It's uh, the performance of uh, red false concrete uh, schools. Uh, also, very rarely we were seeing uh, damaged schools, and even in, in in areas with a lot of damage in the in the, the surrounding area in the residential buildings, we were seeing schools that were looking uh, pretty much intact. And the only uh, uh, damaged schools uh, we saw in Antakya, like the bottom right example, which is, uh, but it's still within the life safety. Mm -hmm performance. But despite of the good performance of, of the schools, the educational process is quite uh, uh, hampered and uh, my, uh, that will be covered more in the next sections of the presentation. Thank you very much. And I uh, will mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, this part of the presentation uh, considers response relief and recovery. Um, uh, on the next slide, you can see we're a team of four that is uh, led by Dr. Osten. Uh, on the next slide. Um, today, we're going to be covering uh, casualties and economic impacts 
uh, and the search and rescue and debris removal and several aspects of uh, relief and early recovery. Uh, in this section of the report, we'll also be looking at housing and urban recovery uh, and construction practices, uh, but we won't present on those today because um, we'll, we'll be doing that in the report because we don't have uh, that much time. Uh, the itinerary that we followed in this group uh, was looking at uh, mostly in the southern regions of Hatay province uh, and the northern uh, regions and villages of Osmanye and Karamara provinces. Um, this slide on population shows that the total uh, population of the 11 earthquake affected provinces is uh, just over 14 million people. Uh, there are also 1.75 million Syrian refugees residing uh, in this region, which is more than half of the total number of uh, people from refugees from Syria living in Turkey. Uh, the following slide shows casualties. Um, as of uh, 20th of March, the total number of confirmed deaths was 50,096. Uh, it's important to note that this does not include people who are missing or presumed to have died in the earthquake. Uh, and this number is being added to uh, if more bodies are recovered. And sadly, even last night, one was found in the debris uh, during debris removal. Um, also to note here, there are almost uh, 1,300 people who've died that have not been identified. Uh, and as the photos show here, uh, this is an ongoing process um, that's assisted by photos that were taken before people were buried and uh, family members can come forward and try to identify people uh, who haven't been identified yet. Um, additionally, uh, it's worth noting that there are 298 arrests so far that have ma been made in connection with negligence in the construction industry, something we'll explore more in the report. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about economic impacts. There are uh, two major reports that have come out that have looked at economic impacts. Um, the official government estimate uh, which came out recently is almost three times the World Bank estimate of economic impacts. Um, and it's worth noting that much of the numbers are really still estimates. Um, probably the direct damages could be more precisely estimated at this point, but certainly indirect damages are quite hard to estimate. That is, you know, how is trade going to be infected, uh, the tourism season, uh, missing out on education, et cetera. These are indirect impacts. Uh, the following slide also looks at economic impacts. Um, even though earthquake insurance is uh, mandatory for households across Turkey since after the 1999 earthquakes, it's estimated that only half of the households in the region uh, actually have a valid policy at the time of the earthquake. Um, so far, 360,000 households have applied for compensation. Uh, it remains to be seen, I think, how having insurance and not having insurance will impact on homeowners in the rebuilding process. Um, additionally, uh, the amount of private vehicles that have been damaged in the earthquake is massive uh, and quite different to previous events, and this is also part of insured losses. The following slide talks about search and rescue. Um, there were a number of, uh, a huge number of people and equipment that have been involved in search and rescue after the, after the earthquakes, both uh, Turkish and foreign groups. Um, there are very many stories that we heard about in the field uh, and on the internet uh, of people in civil society groups that came and participated uh, in this search and rescue. Um, we spoke uh, to one fire station staff in Iskenderam uh, in which uh, 300 people, uh, they saved 300 people in the first days. Um, however, they complained of lack, of lack of equipment and resources to do this. Uh, I think it's worth saying that there's a general criticism of the AFAD search and rescue response, such as poor coordination, uh, which meant that some rescue teams haven't been able, were not able to work effectively. Uh, for example, our drivers who are from Erzan explained that they had brought rented equipment to the worst affected areas but were turned back. Uh, the military was not called into the search and rescue until much later, um, as they couldn't respond without clearance from the government. And this has been an issue uh, throughout the kind of response things that we looked at. Uh, the following slide looks at debris removal. 
uh, debris removal is a massive undertaking, uh, to say the least. Um, according to a government official in Hatay who we spoke to, uh, only 20% of buildings that need demolition have been demolished already. Um, debris is being taken to the outskirts of cities, like this photo uh, in Al-Bistan. Um, debris is supposed to be sorted uh, at a second stage. Um, there's an ongoing trade in debris where people are going into buildings and removing things that can be sold. Um, there's also potential health impacts of these kind of scavenging activities, uh, and many children are involved in this kind of activity uh, at this point in time. You also see going throughout the region that there are many people who are trying to remove their belongings from the damaged buildings with moving vans and cranes, etc., trying to take them out before they're demolished. Um, each day, the municipalities are announcing which areas will be worked on for debris removal. Um, and you can see wherever there's an excavator working, there are people standing on the piles of debris looking through trying to find their belongings. You can see a man in the photo on the bottom on the very left hand side. Um, we were warned before going to the field by UNDP about asbestos risk. Um, yet what you see is that most people are not wearing masks or uh, PPE, uh, despite the sort of clouds of dust where there's debris removal. So this is a big issue. The next slide uh, looks at healthcare response. Um, as mentioned by the infrastructures team, hospitals were badly impacted in the region. Um, the Dorchel Hospital that was mentioned by the infrastructures team uh, was even a shelter at some point. It took in, they believe, between 25 and 30,000 people who stayed in the hospital in the parking lot in the first days of the earthquake uh, before they were moved on elsewhere. When we visited this hospital, since it's the only fully functioning hospital in the region, uh, it was extremely busy. They told us they performed 6,000 surgeries in the first few days, uh, and usually they do 1,000 surgeries a month. Um, there are over 80 field hospitals that have been set up over the earthquake region, uh, many by international groups. This is actually one of the area only areas of relief where you uh, see international support being quite evident. Um, we visited on the last day an Italian field, ho field hospital, Antakya, that's built on the stadium grounds, beautiful hospital uh, that's been operated by uh, Italian medical staff for a month and is now being handed over to Turkish medical staff. Um, there's people coming from all over Turkey on one to two week rotations to work in these kind of hospitals across the region. Uh, we visited one American clinic in Samanda, which is bringing in, for example, 5,000 pairs of eyeglasses as everyone in the earthquake has lost their glasses. So there's a lot of different kinds of access to medical care. However, what we did find on the ground is that many people don't really know where they can access routine medical care. And we've talked to you know quite a few examples of people who, for example, one woman needed uh, treatment for her child who has a brain condition and she didn't know where to go. And so many people are delaying treatment. So there's some communication issues. Um, the following slide uh, shows the locations of field hospitals uh, in Antakya, for example, there are seven field hospitals. Uh, that are operating in Antakya and, and some clinics. Uh, the next slide looks at mental health. Um, the situation at the moment uh, for people who've survived the earthquakes is one of very high anxiety. Um, there is uh, induced by the trauma of the earthquake. There are many impacts on children, uh, people suffering sort of ambiguous loss where they can't mourn the death because uh, they haven't found the body of their loved one. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety about humanitarian means not being met. Um, so there are large teams of personnel as supported by APAD supporting people in the psych psychosocial uh, aspects, but the needs are vast and ongoing. Um, I think it's worth noting that there's also a division in the relief system between Turkish people and Syrian people. Um, and many of the Syrian people are sort of worse off in terms of the access to aid and things that they have. There are also a lot of issues with safeguarding uh, in camps and we have at least uh, two reported deaths and, and violent, sexual violence incidents. If we move on to the next slide on education, uh, despite the limited damage to school structures, as reported by the infrastructures group, education has been severely disrupted in the region. As shown in the map, uh, education has restarted earlier in lesser damaged uh, regions. Um, there's students who are supposed to sit their exams in 8th and 12th grades uh, that are being moved out of the province. There's some issues around what is the fairness of these groups. 
Um, all universities have switched to online education because university dormitories are being used to house affected people across the country. So that was a quite quick shift. Um, on the following slide, we look at migration. Uh, this is a very, very big issue throughout the region. Um, uh, we think that up to 3.3 million people have migrated out of the air earthquake area uh, towards urban centers in the West. Um, there's an estimated, for example, in Antakya, 380,000 people have left. Um, there are networks in these cities operating, but these cities are quite under a lot of pressure across uh, the region to, to help people. Um, on the next slide on sheltering financial support, uh, there is financial support for, for people uh, to rent apartments. Uh, however, this rent is not, not really enough to cover the costs. So what we find is that probably a lot of people are going to be living in containers that are provided by the government. Um, the following slide looks at Syrian migrants. Um, uh, we think, for example, there's been a lot of migration of migrants. Uh, they were, people were allowed to move provinces after the earthquake. Uh, probably 50 to 60,000 people have migrated to Mersin, for example. Um, the following slide looks at temporary sheltering. Uh, AFAD's strategy is to settle people in camps, and there's certainly a tension between people who want to stay near their houses and those being uh, forced to kind of move into camps because that's where uh, aid is available. Um, container camps are quickly being constructed throughout the region. Uh, camps are being run by many different organizations. Uh, there are more informal camps with Syrians that are assisted by NGOs. You may have seen in the news a lot of issues with flooding in the camps, uh, and certainly heat will be a big issue come the summer. Um, uh, there's also on the following slide, people are being housed in tents that people have put in their own uh, gardens or have been built by the roadsides. There's some issues with these tents being built very close to roads, uh, which is quite dangerous uh, for children. Um, there's very interesting examples of different ethnic groups and different groups who've provided sort of networks of relief and supplies uh, throughout the region. Lots of interesting stories there. So on the next slide, my second to last slide, uh, the food is kind of well provided throughout the region. There are hundreds of community kitchens operating, uh, uh, giving hot meals to people. Um, I think the biggest issue with food is around the lack of clean water. So for example, this one kitchen we talked to, they, they were providing three meals a day, but now they can only provide two because they can't wash everything beforehand. They provide everything in takeout containers. And then the following slide is uh, our last slide. Um, I think the coordination of relief supplies ranges from orderly in some places to very chaotic. I think it's become more orderly as time goes on, but we did see a lot of things where supplies are just kind of dropped in the open. People are rushing to kind of get it and some people don't get it, some people get a lot. Um, we witnessed, uh, for example, water shipment at this distribution area in Samanda where people are just coming to try to, to get water. I think water is access to water is a really big issue, especially in the Southern region. So I'll leave it there and uh, we can move on to Yasmin is next, I think on next steps and key messages. Thank you. Thank you, Cassidy. And thank you to the team. Uh, it's been it's been great. Um, I am keenly aware of the time. I am uh, going to talk about very broad, high level key messages before, uh, before we uh, finish uh, for today. Uh, one of the first observations that we wanted to share is that it, it's quite clear in the current Turkish system is that the profit drive pushes all players within the construction industry to take shortcuts. And this uh, this is quite quite obvious on, on a number of uh, levels and the auditing and the quality control mechanisms embedded in the legal and bureaucratic processes therefore should be strengthened so that the code compliance can be, can be ensured. Also, it's quite clear that the legalization of non-compliance buildings cannot continue if we actually want to see a different view uh, following a future major earthquake in Turkey. Uh, another, another important message is that land reclamation using liquefiable materials is quite commonplace and therefore better control over land use is key. Um, we are. Uh, we think that the building stocks and the infrastructure needs to be thoroughly reviewed for their seismic uh, capacity and reuse should be encouraged whenever possible. And this is not only because you know we we want to take the sort of more efficient you know uh, uh, use uh, benefit of the existing structures, but also again uh, to, for, to put a damper on how construction industry is used for uh, quick and easy uh, profits and return. 
uh, we have evidence, we have strong evidence that retrofit, that retrofit can work and therefore should be again encouraged whenever possible and can be designed properly. Uh, one observation that's, that we want to again uh, highlight is that the building stocks in the affected areas, perhaps it, it actually can be generalized for the rest of the, the country, but especially in the affected areas, we have seen that the building stock is very complex and very hard to uh, categorize. So when we went to the field with our data collection tools, uh, we were forced to categorize the buildings as RC buildings or masonry, et cetera. But the, but the typologies are actually very, very hard to uh, categorize with those you know, clear cut uh, sort of terms. And this makes uh, it very difficult to, to assess these structures. And we are hoping that we can actually bring that perspective in our further uh, post-processing uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, as was mentioned before, healthcare infrastructure requires attention, despite a few good examples uh, owed to base isolation. Unfortunately, uh, most of the hospitals uh, haven't performed well, which put further pressures on not only the response and recovery uh, uh, sort of stages, however, also, um, but also on the chronic illnesses in the, in the area. Um, this was a cascading hazards incident, actually. We have seen earthquake, but we have also seen the failure of many sort of uh, lifelines. Uh, there has been a flooding incident uh, towards the end, et cetera. So we should really look into this, this set of events to take note of how different hazards interacted for a more holistic understanding of the events and its, its their impact. Um, it is to us of utmost importance that recovery and reconstruction processes are conducted in a way that allows participation from affected communities and local governments rather than centrally dictated. The experience so far has shown clearly the drawbacks of a very uh, centralized approach, whether it was about the search and rescue or the, the coordination of the aid operations. We propose that working groups with multi-sectoral engagement of key stakeholders and members of the public are set up uh, within the local governances to allow recovery to be sustainable and reconstruction lasting. And we are really hoping that we can see local governments are given the, the power and the authority to be able to manage these processes, uh, processes on their own. Um, again, we think that it is critical that the reconstruction addresses and directly refers to the rich traditional and vernacular forms that exist in every corner of the affected areas. Uh, in Turkey, the legislation is such that with listed monumental structures, uh, you know, what you can do is very, you know, it's very prohibitive, uh, the, the regulations. However, with the, uh, the uh, sort of civil, unlisted civil architecture uh, sort of forms, this can be less so. And, uh, and you know, with, with all the uh, reconstruction efforts, these can actually can, can disappear. So that's a worry. Uh, needlessly to say, recovery should be inclusive of women and children, disabled people, ethnic minorities, and other disadvantaged groups. The events will definitely have long-term perturbations and therefore need to be thought through from all angles uh, rather than rushed. Uh, the population exchanges and the migration is dynamic and is going to remain dynamic for another long while, especially for the rural communities, the need to be able to go back to their, their lands after a while because they need to tend their, uh, their, their land or they need to tend their, their herd uh, is a big thing and therefore shelter needs is going to remain most critical for another while. There is uh, a wide, widespread psychological trauma as aspirated by uncertainty. And when I say uncertainty, I refer both to the time frame, so people actually do not know when they are going to basically uh, get sort of, again, another shelter or when um, sort of their homes are going to be taken down, but also how the entire process is going to be uh, managed by the state and what, what is going to be their responsibility in all of these things remains unclear. Um, as Cassidy was saying, alternative networks of coordination seem to be working very, very well. And this again shows that rather than a centralized approach, having alternative routes of aid and, and relief uh, processes is very, very important. And lastly, I want to say that there are very strong scientific and policy opportunities for impact. The well-distributed network in the area provides, it allows us to comprehend the characteristics of ground motions and be able to correlate them with damage especially the uh, very high vertical acceleration values and provisions regarding soft soil conditions need to transpire in the code revisions that's going to follow in the coming months and years. Um, 
I also want to say a few things uh, on the next step for uh, our team here. As was mentioned before, this was a hybrid mission. So uh, in addition to the field team going on the grounds and collecting all the data and doing a damage assessment, we also have collected a lot of uh, visual material uh, with us and uh, on our way back. The remote team is currently working on the blind secondary assessment of the, of the, the, uh, the, the damage with us. And this is, this is not only to ensure that there are no any systematic biases and errors in our data set, but also to, to be able to have the communication conversation with regards to the typologies and dam damage types. We are going to maximize the, the damage assessment uh, activity also by remotely assessing the, the visual material that we have collected. And these are all going to be consolidated and used for uh, to deriving further conclusions on the performance of building stocks and fragility of individual typologies. We are intending to carry out a very thorough review of the construction law and building regulatory system uh, to be able to more specific uh, on the weak points and where exactly things go pear-shaped. Uh, again, it remains a very uh, vital and uh, open research question. What can we learn from the local seismically resistant typologies for rapid and cost-effective reconstruction and shelter needs? Uh, we have already started to engage with stakeholders when we were on the ground and, and uh, before that as well. Uh, this is uh, the mayors, the muftars, uh, many uh, local uh, university uh, sort of members, but also local built environment professionals. And we are going to continue to, to communicate with them so that we can develop a more holistic understanding as to the, the different perspectives and experience of, uh, of people involved. Again, collaboration with many local and international colleagues is very important for us, and we feel very strongly as a team that we should be embedded with local teams, especially to help with reconstruction and recovery, acting as an advocate for their work and together come up with strategies for good building practices. And this is not only for this event, but it is uh, it is uh, you know quite a you know a global principle that we uh, that we abide with. And after all of these uh, events, we are going to uh, produce a report, which uh, we hope that is going to be out uh, by the end of May. So watch the space uh, for the for the report. Um, we also want to thank many individuals and organizations who helped us uh, on the ground. Of course, the people of the affected areas uh, being the, the fourth foremost, they have uh, shared their stories and you know, admitted us uh, into their lives. We are very thankful to everybody uh, I am, as I said, keenly aware of the time, and I think the team actually has gone through all the questions. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe we can just uh, close the close the session. <laughs>